Hi all, and welcome to the Old Iron Talk podcast. I'm your host, Callie Gurton, and today we are here with Michael Keller, who is the author of the Graham Bradley Tractor, a history book. Michael, could you let everybody know kind of where you're from and a history behind you? Well, I'm from Appleton, Wisconsin, and um, if three years ago, if someone would have said, Michael, you're going to be writing a tractor book, I would kind of laugh because um, I have Graham Page automobiles. I've okay. been studying Graham Page automobiles and the, the, the uh, Graham family for the last 45 years. Yeah. I'm blessed to have three Graham Page automobiles made in 1929. Wow. Um, having done all that research a number of years ago, I came out with a two volume history of the Graham Page Motors Corporation. In that second volume, I had a page and two pictures about the Graham Bradley tractor because that was all I knew about the tractor. Uh, There was very little research. There was very little known. I couldn't find any more than that. And that was the part of the the, the Graham legacy books that came out. Over 2019, in the fall of the year, I got a telephone call. One of the Graham brothers, Robert, the middle son, his grandson had found a banker's box full of, uh, it, 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 the box was marked tractor on it mm-hmm. in, in a place that had been neglected in a closet that hadn't been opened for years and years. And inside there were 75 pictures of the Graham Bradley prototypes, wow. of the Graham Bradley factory. There was all sorts of uh, inter-office memos between the Grahams and the engineers and other folks. And then also importantly, there was correspondence between Graham Page Motors Corporation and Sears Roebuck, who eventually turned into the merchandiser of Mm -hmm. the tractor. And I kind of smiled uh, because I said, you know, I don't know very much about tractors. And they said, well, you're going to start learning right now. You you need to write another book. And indeed, I had two technical uh, advisors, uh, uh, Chad Elmore and James Fred. And whenever I had a question, whenever anything I needed to explain to this city boy, Mm -hmm. I grew up in a Wisconsin city of 2,500 people, (laughs) this urban guy. um, Again, I could tell you all kinds of things about cars, but at that point I was learning about tractors. And indeed they guided me. I did a deep, deep dive and it resulted in a 344 page hardcover book um, because it's not specifically and entirely about the uh, the Graham Bradley tractor. Okay. It's how the Graham ba- Bradley tractor fits into the context of tractor industry evolution. In other words, as I, I like to say, you know, in 1936, the Graham brothers didn't fall out of a tree and say, hey, let's build a tractor. <laughs> there was a reason for this. There was a reason why they got involved. It was... Uh, the context of the entire industry and this one thread in that fabric was Mm -hmm. the Graham Bradley fabric. So when you start reading this book, you're going to see that I tried to explain to the best of my ability um, the opening of the Great Plains and the plows were first used with horse flesh and how that transitioned into the huge steam tractors that we all know and Mm -hmm. love and how those steam tractors then evolved into the gasoline and the kerosene and the modern modern tractors okay. and such. So this is not one of those enthusiast books where it just talks about one model for one year because the guy's crazy about it. Mm-hmm. It's trying to be historically accurate. And again, the key word is context in that regard. For example, uh, you really need to understand, if you understand the Graham Bradley history, is that the three Graham brothers grew up on a farm in southern Indiana. Uh, Washington, Indiana. It was the largest farm in the state of Indiana. Zebra wow. was their father. So the three Graham brothers grew up on a farm. Uh, the farm was part and parcel of their upbringing and mm-hmm. also their later lives. Um, the three Graham brothers, Joseph, uh, uh, Bob, and Ray, uh, they became successful businessmen. First in the glass industry in Logo- Lagodi, Indiana. And then they got involved with uh, Graham Brothers Trucks. Mm-hmm. And then they yeah. were executives at Gra- uh, uh, the Grahams were executives at the Dodge uh, Brothers, uh, again, with trucks. And then in 1927, they bought the Page Motor Car Company. Mm-hmm. That turned into Graham Page the next year and became very, very successful in the first two years. Yeah. In other words, when the stock market crashed, 
their sales. I mean, they started out terrific. They won sales awards for yes. most, most cars sold by a brand new company. But the depression really, really affected them. Mm -hmm. And by mid 30s, the mid 1930s, there was a question whether they survive or not. So here's the successful trio of businessmen that have a half empty factory just outside of Detroit. And they say, hey, we grew up with tractors. We know about tractors. Let's build a tractor that we can sell. And that'll hold us over until the car industry sales come back to mm -hmm. what was normal. Yeah. And, and again, they, they simply weren't uh, boys running around their dad's big farm. Um, they eventually took control. As a matter of fact, uh, Ray Graham went to the University of Illinois and got an agriculture degree. Came back to Washington and said, we're going to make my dad's farm the most scientific, the most uh, efficient, and the most modern farm. And it was, it was national news, in addition to the local news, when he bought a uh, giant horse. The next year was called Big Four, but it gas traction company of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. When it was unloaded there, there were news people there. When it was tried out the first day, there were it was written up nationally and locally. Um, he got the spark. He wanted yeah. to improve the farm and he knew he could do better than this. So in 1915, he and one of his engineers on the farm uh, designed the very first tractor by the Grahams. And it was a, a, a drum drive and it was just three wheels. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't really get very far beyond the prototype stage. Yeah. There were some concerns and problems. Obviously, that happens many times in a, in a new and evolving industry. Yes. But by 1919, there was a Graham Brothers tractor. They came out that was uh, well designed. It was professionally produced, and they were all ready to, to introduce it to the market in addition to the trucks that they were producing at that time. Uh, but there was a pandemic, and there was World War I, and there was a man by the name of Henry Ford that already had a massive amount of the, the, the share. Mm -hmm. So they declined to do that. They focused on the trucks and became the largest independent truck uh, producer in the United States. But then again, that brings you to the crash of the stock market where that established thing went down. Now, yeah. they had been running and improving the farm throughout. They've been developing tractors throughout the 20s and 30s. And indeed, when they uh, did the uh, first experimental work in 1936, mm -hmm. uh, everything was going for them. Um, there's a photo of, uh, even before they did a Nebraska test, they took the tractor up to Canada and entered into a plowing contest okay. up there. Cool. And much to the surprise, not to the Green Brothers, but much to the surprise of everyone else, it won first prize. Oh, yeah. So even before it was introduced, this was uh, getting some really good ink and some good publicity. That's crazy. Um, the thing to, again, put it into context is that the Grahams had all this agriculture background. Mm -hmm. They had mechanical background. They had engineers that could design this really streamlined, stylish, and powerful tractor. Powerful in that... Um, it actually had a Graham car engine at B2, okay. so it would be uh, good for field work. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened is that, yes, they had this tractor. Yes, they had all the expertise behind them. But obviously, they didn't have a tractor sales force. They didn't have distributors. Mm -hmm. They didn't have dealerships anywhere. So, so how do you sell that? And that was a major stumbling block. And again, in this box, there were some of the early correspondence between Sears okay. and Graham Page. And Sears was the world's largest merchandiser at that time. We've all seen the huge catalogs and yeah. they just dominated. So it was a marriage made in heaven. The expertise and already developed tractor by Graham Page mm -hmm. and the world's largest merchandiser that would did it into the catalog, which went into every rural community, every community, and every family had a had a Sears yeah, catalog. Yes. So everything was looking great. They won that. The Nebraska test was entirely successful. Um, in the correspondence, Sears talked about the fact that uh, we know things will start slow yeah. because you know Case has been around forever, John Deere's mm -hmm. been around forever, all these other stand. Uh, a standalone tractor manufacturer has mm -hmm. been doing this for years and they have a relationship with 
uh, farmers. Yeah. And, you know, they traded in and they know them and their neighbors and their local and such. So, again, Grand Page said, well, we'll make sure that the Sears stores can service them as well. Uh, we'll make sure that since your uh, Sears was going to have patience with them, mm -hmm. that they would be able to build up. Within a year, they figured they'd be making 5,000 tractors a year. They'd be making 10,000 tractors a year after wow. that because of the reach of, uh, of Sears. I mean, Bradley implements have been part and parcel ever since the horse drawn. Yes, the, yes. So, gosh, everything looked great. Everything looked terrific. But again, this is where putting all that ahead of it, mm -hmm. and right up to it, puts things into context. And the thing is, is they really had a sharp hill to climb. The established tractor companies weren't going to make it easy no, for a new company not. Into, into the system. And Sears, who had promised them patience because they knew that you would be starting from you know, square mm -hmm. one, within a year lost patience. And their profitability became first and foremost before any foundation of, of a reputation. Uh, for example, there's an illustration of the book of the advertising in the Sears catalog. Mm -hmm. well, Sears had promised that that would be the focal point and it would be two full pages. Well, number one, if you look at that illustration, you're going to see it's the top half of two pages. Mm -hmm. And unbeknownst to the folks at Graham Page, they had also contracted with another outside source to provide what was known as the Sears Economy Tractor. That tractor was one page before that, and it had a full page. Oh, boy. Another thing Sears did, which is inexplicable in every sense, is that the $495 Sears Economy mm -hmm. was an entry-level bare-bones tractor, and the, the price was... Uh, and this is stripped down, no extras on it at all, was stripped down, tracker was proudly proclaimed in big, bold letters. The next pages mm -hmm. with the top half for Graham Page, no mention of any price whatsoever. So when customers opened up that catalog and they looked at this bare bone and say, $4.95, well, that, that's a pretty yeah, good deal. Yeah, good deal. And then they turn the page and they see this Art Modern, they see this very stylish, streamlined tractor that has a car engine that can get you to 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 uh, from the field to the uh, uh, where your, your your grains and such are going to mm -hmm. process. You can go twenty five miles an hour in this tractor, yeah. but with no price. Everybody assumed this was in the Cadillac range, yeah. and they couldn't afford that. And that's why they didn't put the price in. And again, since sales did not take off. Um, it, it, it hurt. It, it yeah. hurt them. Very, and that's why it ended up that there basically were about 2,300 tractors that we can... Okay, and return. I was going to say, there was only really two models that they built, correct? Correct. Okay. There were two experimental models that were built to show to the Sears executives, which they did okay. on the Graham Farms. And they, and they said, well, this is fine. This is terrific. Yeah. Um, yeah. We got some suggestions, but what you're doing is just fine. So they took care of those suggestions and they came out with a prototype. There were 231 prototypes made. Okay. They were sold in 1937. Uh, the way to distinguish those from the production tractors mm -hmm. of 38 and 39 is that they didn't have any serial numbers on them. They went by engine number. Okay. What they knew the future was. Yeah. Be. So those would be the prototypes. And then the actual production models came out in the uh, early 1938 and were built into 19. 39. Okay. Um, but again, the thing is, is that um, when the a, the uh, experimental models were mm -hmm. set up, they said, well, we will build these in our plant, but we only have temporary tools. We need to set up an actual real assembly line, and that's going to cost 25 grand. So Sears Roebuck and Company said, fine, we'll split that. Okay. They never, ever paid their half. Wow. And if you study the the uh, annual reports from Graham Page, uh -huh. it says continue, continue, continue with that debt that was never, ever paid. Wow. They gave them short shift on the advertising. Yeah. The folks that were going to be servicing the mm -hmm. tractors at the Sears stores and the Graham Farm stores, they didn't have a clue. Yeah. Um, they're used to fixing lawnmowers. And yes. Garden mowers and tillers and things like that. So... Sears promised that they would be prepared. They were never, ever prepared. 
That is crazy. So, to me, the heartbreak of this story is that well, anybody that owns a Graham Bradley tractor will say, this is terrific. This yeah. Is, the, the engineering is fabulous. It's got a car engine that's detuned for farm mm -hmm. work. Um, it's got everything that you would need. And by the way, the Graham tractor, and there were instances afterwards where they advertised all the extras on the tractor were included. It was all, there okay. was no extra charge for the lights on the fenders, for the bolt, uh, belt pulley, for um, any of the other things. Those were all inclusive mm -hmm. of the price. You know, and the sad thing was, it was a thousand thirty dollar tractor. Wow. And that was right in line with Oliver of yeah. the day, except that it was much more well equipped than the Oliver. And Don't tell Kurt that. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So it was one of those things where a manufacturer had a great product and simply it failed simply because he couldn't get that message out to enough people yeah. soon enough. As one of my friends said, you know, no one ever walked into a Sears farm store on Friday night after they did their grocery shopping and I look at that new tractor and say, yeah, I'm a Graham Bradley man now. You know, people yep. say they're deer men, people mm -hmm. say they're Oliver men. Yes. Um, no offense, ladies. But <laughs> no one ever walked in and said, that's a cool tractor. And from now on, I'm a Graham Bradley guy. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, when you've got a relationship, when someone fixed your broken tractor two years before, exactly. where are you going to go when you need a new tractor yep. or you need repairs? Not this new people that make really terrific cars. Yeah. But we're not really sure how good they are tractors. Exactly. Yet. They haven't proven themselves. Mm -hmm. So... Um, they kind of tripped when they got out of the starting blocks. Yeah. Um, no matter how fast you are, if you trip at the starting block, you're not going to win the race. No, you're not. So what's like the difference between the two models that they did originally start with, the two Visually, prototypes? Visually, when you look at the two models, you're going to see that on the prototypes in mm -hmm. 1937, there is an air cleaner that protrudes from the front of the hood. Okay. That's the most visible thing. You're going to okay. see. Importantly, when the 38s came out in the spring of 1938, they had found that there were some some problems with the engine. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 199 cubic inches, and they were blowing head gaskets. Oh, you know, every new product's got things got to yeah. sorted out. And the car engine, when you detuned it, it didn't work quite exact. So they moved up to a 217 inch a cubic inch engine okay. which had twice as many bolts holding down the head yes. to solve the problem completely. Okay. So um visually again the air cleaner is going to be your deal. Um when you look at the the smoothness again of the mm -hmm. 38s and 39s you can say boy that was a that was an artistic improvement <laughs> on these. Um, and for the most part the other things you can't see okay. are mechanical works if you yeah um, but they so, kind of change. So you know, people walking by a Model A, if they don't know about Model A, that you don't know the difference between a 9 and a 31. Mm -hmm. There are people that go to a tractor store and say, oh, there's Grand Track mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, they don't know that it's a yes. 37 or a 38 mm -hmm. because there's so, so few. One of the things, too, is that um, when this was set up, these it was a row crop tractor. Okay. And they did that because they assumed that most sales were going to be in the Midwest mm -hmm. and row crop would be appropriate. And then eventually they would move into the standard, the wide front, mm -hmm. for those folks on the coast that did uh, orchards, people that hills and all that yep. sort of thing. And actually they built one in 1937, and we don't know exactly how many, okay. uh, but probably a couple hundred of the standards in 38s. But again, the, the lack of sales was shutting things down. I mean, they were going great guns and they had to start laying off people because yeah. there, there wasn't that demand there. And there was never the demand for the standard tractor because it wasn't advertised on the East West Coast. You know, Sears had regional catalogs and they mm -hmm. concentrated on they thought would be the gold mine. Yeah. Which eventually would have been. Would, but yeah. But it didn't turn out that way. Yep. So I know, like you had said previously, it started out, they were Graham Page. Then when the Great Depression happened, this is when they got into the tractors. Did they ever go back and make vehicles again? The, uh, the, the last Graham Page, well, let me explain it this way. Again, trying to be in context. Um, uh, in 1932, Graham Page had introduced the first streamlined automobile, okay. which called the Blue Streak. 
uh, it was a depression, so it didn't sell that. Mm -hmm. In 1938, they said, if we come up with a brand new, again, streamlined design, it was called the Spirit of Motion. And that was being built at the same time as the tractors were. And it was a radical design, and in my opinion, and many others, really good yeah. looking. But you either loved it, you hated it. Yeah. And again, it didn't sell that well. Okay. So when that was done, a, a, a last ditch effort was to go in Hollywood in 1940 and 1941. Again, streamlined based on a previous Ford model. Mm -hmm. But the winds of war had been blowing quite rapidly, and there weren't that many people that wanted to invest that kind of money, new car money, into a company that's been in the headlines because they're tottering. Yes, they're yeah. They're going to turn into a uh, turn into a, an orphan make, as they call it. But what happened is that as they found themselves leaving the automobile industry, the winds of war, they started making amphibious tractors. Okay. In other words, amphibious landing vehicles for the War Department prior to the war, mm -hmm. they knew what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, so the first time since 1932 that grain cave became profitable is when they started making these amphibious uh, tractors for the government, for the Navy and for the, the Marines. Uh, they're famous for being used on beaches in D-Day and uh, Okinawa and, okay. uh, and all the different places. Um, so they finally started making money. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 this was no sales involved. You thought the government says, we want yep. this. So they had designed that during the war. Joseph Frazier uh, became president when, uh, when Joe Graham mm -hmm. retired, um, bought 51% of the stock, again, became very successful with the amphibious landing vehicles. And it was his desire to build tractors by Graham Page. Mm -hmm. The company was still intact. Uh, after the war as okay. well. And uh, he engaged a uh, design company, a style company, with some designs of what would be good after mm -hmm. the war. Again, continually with the stylish type thing. And some of the drawings are really quite impressive. And I think you've got one of those to show. Uh, unfortunately, Joseph Frazier's best business days were behind him. Okay. And uh, rather than Coming up with the tractor immediately, they kept on improving, improving. It never really came out. It was in prototype stage. Yeah. He focused on the rototiller, and that's not going to sustain you. No. I mean, that was a garden yeah. tiller. People were waiting for the new Graham uh, Bradley or Graham Page tractor, which never ever came. It just kind of faded okay. away. But what's interesting is that the Graham com Graham Page company mm -hmm. survived new board of directors, new president and such. They became an investment company. Um, uh, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Belt that took over, who was a Wall Street hotshot. Tremendous growth, he got into a, a real estate investments and Graham Page actually owned uh, Madison Square Garden. Okay. Uh, half of downtown New York. They owned the New York Knicks. They wow. owned the, uh, the Rangers, the hockey yeah. team. Very, very successful. And then there's been a number of uh, corporate takeovers. They've lost the name since 1962, uh, but they now basically own the cable television uh, industry in New York. Okay. So, so it's, it's still around, but in a different sense and a different name. Yeah. But the the, the, the last Frazier tractor, which mm -hmm. would look like Rampage, would have been 47. And okay. it never was seriously considered for production, but it's really neat to look at. It is. Person. Miranda, do you want to pull that up for everybody so they can see the Frazier tractor when you got a second here? So as you guys can see, this is what he was explaining. This is the one of the Frazier tractors that, so this was for the military then, correct? No. This, no. no. The, the amphibious tractors were the, uh, the they would, a, a ship would bring the Marines or okay. the Navy close to the shore. And then they would drop these in, they would bring them to the shore, the front would drop down, and the, the, the sailors and the Marines would mm -hmm. run out onto the shore. Okay. So it was an amphibious landing vehicle. Okay. But they were called Amtraks because they are amphibious tractors. Okay. That's so in name, cool. at least they were tractors. Yes. But this uh, the stylish one that you just showed here, that would be the one that was post-war. Okay. Right? When Joseph Frazier. Frazier was, was okay. Okay, and then Miranda, if you don't mind, just going back and bringing up the Graham Bradley so they can see what we've kind of been talking about this whole time. Um, this image is in your book. So that's just a preview of one. 
that shows in the book. And then if you want to go to the next one too, Miranda, who is this that's standing with the this tractor? This was uh, Canada's most famous plowman, which Graham okay. Page hired just for that 1937 show up in, okay. up in Canada. Uh, and, you know, business is business, right? Mm -hmm. Advertising is advertising. Yeah. Um, he took the one standard tractor up to Canada and he won it with that. But the advertising with the loving cup on the hood there shows the row crop because that's where they wanted to sell mm -hmm. the tractors to the Midwest. So, uh, yeah, he, 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 he kind of a stylish looking guy. Yeah, for, not for too bad. Man, right? <laughs> <laughs> he has some style to him and for sure. He, he was an employee for a couple months after that. Yeah. And he went back to Canada and, and Graham Page started fighting with Sears again. Okay. And then if you also want to pull up for them this article that was in your book too. Now, is this an advertisement that they had? Yeah, yeah. so this okay. is on page 1022 or something like that. Mm -hmm. You can see on both pages, the upper half is of the Graham Bradley tractor. Yes. There's no price there, a lot of details, mechanics and such. Mm -hmm. But the bottom half, because Sears own Bradley, is... Bradley implements. Okay. So in other words, there's no emphasis on the tractor. It's equal to what they would be pulling, which Sears yes. sold. One of the concerns for people opening that up too is because since there was no explanation by Sears that you could hook up other implements, mm -hmm. a lot of people, number one, assumed it was way more expensive because there was no price put on it, thicker shop, that sort of thing. Yeah. And number two, a lot of people assumed you had to have a Bradley implement. Oh, okay. Pull. You couldn't get a universal type mm -hmm. set up, which you, you could. Yeah, use. that's crazy. Crazy so, how, so yeah. So, again, I keep smiling because I don't think after 1938, the Graham brothers and their families ever bought anything out of a Sears catalog. I mean, I don't blame them. I don't think I would either. So, <laughs> do not blame them at all for that. That is very interesting, though. I've never heard that in depth of the story behind Graham Bradley. Um, and, and again, I had no clue three and a half yeah. years ago. Um, there, at the Graham uh, Bradley Tractor Club, James Fred is president there, mm -hmm. and he had a lot of insight. But again, I took a much, much deeper dive yes, into it, say. and uh, he pointed a number of things out to me, and mm -hmm. I pointed a number of, out to him. He, it was just a really good uh, coordination between yes. his effort as a farmer who restores cars and has mm -hmm. a Graham Bradley and a serious economy. And he's got the boots on the ground, so to speak. And my part being a little bit more academic and mm -hmm. a little more literary about it. And he was such a good teacher. Oh, and good. Chad Elmore, who is a tractor historian, they were such good tra uh, tractor instructors for me. Is yeah. that uh, I pretty much soaked up everything they said. Oh, good. And, and again, it was not without me questioning if they said, well, you know, A, B, C. And mm -hmm. I'm saying, well, DEF sounds a little bit better. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So I, there were two hour conversations on uh, on the telephone at night about how many lug nuts were used. Yeah. And, uh, was it a double pinstripe or was it a single pinstripe? And how can we prove that? Yeah. So, um, you know, so the, the book is, is, forgive me for doing this, but I think it's so important, putting the Graham Bradley in context, mm -hmm. not only with the Graham Page Company, Sears, and the overall um, industry as it were back then um, but again research is fun as i mentioned to you off camera before so there are appendixes in the book okay appendices. Uh, the first one talks about all those minute details this mm -hmm. is where the the graham Bad bradley historian and the graham i mean this gets down to the nitty-gritty yeah. where the, it's 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 really really involved there's another appendix there that talks about graham bradley in canada Okay. Uh, the plains of Saskatchewan are mm -hmm. perfect for, for that. And again, they, they were very successful in up there. There's correspondence that I quote in there about what it would cost and what the import uh, would be and uh, the Canadian uh, territorial taxes and mm -hmm. such. Um, then I also have, uh, and Chad Elmer wrote this one because he's very familiar. There's an entire appendix about the Sears farm stores. Okay. Um, James Fred has been uh, researching all the known existing Graham Bradley tractors, mm -hmm. so I set up a chart in there. Again, we don't have serial numbers, it was interesting, but yeah. my engine numbers for 37, and then I've got the, the row crop and the standard divided in there. 
Um, I made a listing of all known uh, Graham Bradley sales literature, both by Sears and by Graham Page. And the manuals are different wow. as well. Um, and uh, there, there was a good bit of newspaper and uh, magazine advertising. I got a good sampling of that okay. in Illustrator as well. Uh, the Nebraska mm -hmm. test is in there, so you can see it's, it's packed with flying colors mm -hmm. and all the things with an explanation of that. And and then to me, one of the most fun chapters, the the the, the one that was so revelatory to me, was about Graham Bradley toys, scale models, okay. and pedal tractors. And uh, I learned a great deal. That's maybe one of the longest ones. In yeah, it talks about Auburn rubber. It talks about diecast precision okay. uh, promotions in there, but the and I was nearing the end of the book, mm -hmm. and I was given a tip, and we followed it up on that. I think Chad Elmer had the tip. Um, we all know how popular Legos are yes. in our world, not only for kids. In the Lego community, there's something called MOC Mox, My Own Creation, for those people that say. Lego doesn't make enough of their rather expensive kits, you know, in yeah. all the directions. So yes. they make their own. And there was an engineer whose brother had a Graham Bradley tractor. So he made a Lego Graham Bradley Oh, that's tractor, very cool. Which is really yeah. neat. And um, instructions are in line. I've got a bunch of pictures on okay. that the other ones. And um, again, the pedal tractors, uh, they're occasionally out there as yes, well. Yes, they are. And it, Lots of different variations, mm -hmm. and there are people that cast in the 50s and 60s out of metal, and I've got all those variations in there okay. as well. And at the at the end of the book, um, I kind of again smile sometimes yeah. because if you go on eBay, you're going to find that you can buy photocopied uh, Graham Bradley owner's manual, mm -hmm. and they're photocopies. Mm -hmm. And they're getting between forty and fifty dollars. Yes. This book, which is forty four ninety five, has okay. that entire story, and in the back, it has not only a reproduction of the owner's manual, but the shop manual. Yes. So it's seventy one pages of everything you would ever want to know if you owned a Graham uh -huh. Bradley tractor. That coupled with the appendix with all the mechanical mm -hmm. stuff in there, um, the three of us and and me especially wanted to make sure just. It's like my Graham Page car books. Yes. We want this to be an end-all. There's probably not going to be three, four more books coming out in the next six months about Graham Bradley. Yeah. So we wanted this to be as full, as complete, as informative, as as the end-all. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we can't learn more. No. Because obviously yeah. nobody knows everything. I exactly. Everything. Yeah. I, and I'm eager to hear more new information. Mm -hmm. Um, but we wanted this to be something that not only a Graham Bradley owner or enthusiast would enjoy, mm -hmm. but by putting it in context, we tried to make it so, and I'm going to talk about this at the the, the uh, presentation tomorrow, is that, you know, well, that's all well and good, Michael. I've got an Oliver. I've got a heart car. Why do yes. I need a Graham Bradley? But again, if you start reading that and you start reading the early history of how this all fit together, be a great thing for future farmers of America to have mm -hmm. the bookshelf for local libraries. Yes. Time. One of the uh, one of the uh, most meaningful compliments that, that I have gotten is that a a well known vintage tracker expert, and I'm not going to mention his name, I don't want to embarrass him, uh, read the book and said, you know, all that stuff in the beginning about the tractor evolution. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I knew a bunch of that stuff, but I didn't know why. Michael, you explained why these things transition from here yeah. to there. And again, humbly, I took that as a huge compliment. Mm -hmm. So if this man gives me a compliment, I figured I'd get it. <laughs> did an okay did an job. Okay job. So, so, so. Well, good. So, so and, indeed, um, you'll probably talk about this book is directly uh, from the Midwestern Publishing. I was going to ask M you that. Okay. MT Publishing, M okay. period, T period, Mark Thompson. He was also the publisher of my two Graham Page books. Okay. And we're very successful. And you're going to, when you look at it, um, I work really closely with the graphic 
cards. Okay. Uh, we, we we designed specific pages. We talked about the the photos. Um, she's she has uh, bordered them very very well. But one of the things I did in the card books mm -hmm. is I took the green page emblem, and on the bottom of each page, the outline of the emblem I had the page number. Oh, cool. When we started getting close to this, I talked to a graphic artist up in Appleton, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I said, I would like, I, I went to the local art gallery and I said, I don't know the art community. Who can do line drawings and pointillism for mm -hmm. me? And they pointed out the gentleman. And um, he came up with four line drawings of the Graham Bradley tractor. So when you look at the bottom of the, each page, mm -hmm. where the page, the rear wheel has the page number. Okay. Inserted. Inserted. That is That's cool. That's just a number on yeah. the bottom. It's, it's got intricate detail to it. That yeah. is very cool. And then, too, we again, uh, there's, I don't know, 240, 250 photos in here. Okay. Over 200 have never, ever been published before. Wow. Uh, these these were new to me. They were new to most folks. Mm -hmm. uh, um, not only from the, 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 the banker's box, but there are other folks that contributed when they found out I was doing yeah. this sort of thing, other personal things. Yes. Um, there was some advertising that when folks found out through the Graham Bradley Club that we were doing this. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm kind of like the den mother because I did a lot of the research and yeah. did all the writing, but by the same token, there were a lot of very interested people that made huge contributions. Okay. Couldn't have done it all by myself. When, Every author says that. Yes. When did this book come out? In January, In January. Okay. Just a couple of months ago. And months how ago. long did it take you to write, would you say? Um, I said, when I found out about this banker box, uh -huh. I made arrangements with the grandson, who I'd known before, and went down there, went through everything, wrote back, and once I got to Wisconsin, I started on day one. Okay. So uh, 2019, uh, I think it was October. The World Series was on, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, it was uh, October 2019, and I presented the finished manuscript in June of last year, I think wow. it was. So, That's incredible. Uh, I was retired from my profession so I could focus yeah. on this and, and talk to my sister if I could focus on something I, I could read. That's incredible. That is very <laughs> impressive. But I, I feel blessed because I've learned so much. And, and I've gotten a number of personal comments and reviews and people have said, Michael, we bought the book because we want to support you. We don't know yeah. that much about tracking. <laughs> and this, this one female professor that I wrote back and said, I never paid much attention to tracking before. This is fascinating stuff. It is. Just the history that you've shared have today. They see a yeah. tractor when they're driving down a country road, but mm -hmm. they don't think about what's involved. In exactly. And I have to plead guilty because I didn't know all that stuff. Yeah. Either. So so this is amazing. To it me is. That, uh, I could learn that much that I could write a book and I could be sitting here with a couple pretty girls in the room. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. The history that is behind it, just that you've shared with us, is incredible. And I did not. I knew details. I knew that they were originally Grand Page and it was vehicles and then the Great Depression happened. But, you know, I, I, I talk about smiling broadly and silently yeah. sometimes. Um, so I get back and I go on YouTube, mm -hmm. and there are a number of Graham Bradley YouTube um, videos on there. I'm not sure how long information I is can there, imagine, and yeah. Is the truth. Maybe somebody's grandpa told them something, yes. and they misremembered it, and they said, well, there was such and such, and I'm saying, well, <laughs> not, not quite. Really, you know, but I, I am. I understand your sincerity yeah, and that yeah. grandpa's story messed up. You know, that's not your fault. No, yeah. It is your fault. But <laughs> you repeated it. But, um, uh -huh. So, handle the internet with caution. Yes, for sure. <laughs> well, that was very nice having you on today. No, this, are... is, uh, this is another blessing that I'm able to share this with you and whoever might be listening yeah. in. And again, even if you say I'm not a Graham Bradley guy, I think that there was some some value for sure yes reading about the industry and, and how it worked mm -hmm. it was again revelatory to me yes definitely and we definitely encourage everyone to check out this book and if you would repeat again where they can purchase it, it the publishing company is called m t publishing uh, it's m period t period stands for mark thompson who is the, uh, the publisher 
It's in Evansville, Indiana. Um, you can go online and catch that. And mm -hmm. there's an 800 number. And I always suggest to people that they order directly through the phone or online with publisher. Yes. I know it's listed on Amazon, but Amazon is not kind to publishers. They almost have to give the books away to get them listed yeah. there. So um, it's, if you want to support people that publish esoteric subjects like this and tractor books and car books about things that were made, you know, 50, 60 years mm -hmm. ago, uh, support the publisher by buying directly from Buying directly, yes, for okay. sure. Well, is there anything else you would like to share before we... Um, I, again, I'm honored and blessed to be able to okay. be on this with you, and I, I appreciate your, your courtesy to me and Kurt's courtesy to me for, for yep. setting this up. <laughs> um, you know, Kurt made it, he said she's got some pretty tough questions, but Kurt doesn't know me that well. You didn't ask me <laughs> questions because I just kept you, on you, talking. Yeah, didn't you I? had the history, so <laughs> I think you answered everything before I even asked. So. <laughs> Trying to make your job easier. Exactly. <laughs> But no, it was very informative and we're very thankful for the history and knowledge that you shared with us. And it was great to have you on. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kurt. Yep. And as always, don't forget to visit us at oldirongarage.com to collect with other collectors and enthusiasts. And we hope you check back and follow our Facebook and Instagram to stay tuned for when our next episode will be. Thanks. <laughs>